found the yes, we found the the second lecture, I guess. No. <laughs> Okay, thank you. No, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, it doesn't. Yeah, I will fix it otherwise. Is it okay? Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so good afternoon to everybody. So, here is basically the, 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 the short summary uh, of, of the previous lectures. I mean, essentially what everything that I uh, told you yesterday is written on the blackboard. So again, I remind you that uh, I was considering the, the, cases of, the case of IID random variables, meaning independent and identically distributed random variables uh, with some density P of X, okay? And uh, I was looking for, I mean, I was mainly interested in Xmax, the largest uh, values of the X size. And uh, what I want to compute is basically the distribution of this, of this guy in the large N limit. So I, I first uh, made some uh, heuristic arguments to evaluate the typical value uh, UN. Uh, that, stage, uh, that stage typical was not extremely precise, but uh, I tried to convince you that this gives an estimate of the scale of either of x max or of its fluctuations. And I convince you that I gave you this argument uh, that mu n is given by this formula where x star is the edge of the support of p of x, okay, so which might be infinite. And, uh, and then the second step was to really compute, uh, I mean, to be more precise and to have access to the full distribution of x max, so namely here the, its cumulative distribution, the probability that x max is less than m. And I showed you that uh, there is a fairly explicit formula in this case, uh, which is written there. And of course we want to study the large n limit of this, of this quantity. And uh, I also explained to you that if I don't do anything, uh, meaning if I just take the large n limit of this quantity, then I would just obtain a sort of theta function. Oh, I'm sorry. I mean, uh, I feel that, uh, okay, let's try to do that maybe, okay. Um, so if you don't do anything, well, uh, to M, essentially, if you just take the large N limit with a finite X star, for instance, you would just obtain a pure theta function, uh, which is a bit uninteresting, which does not give so much information. And instead, if you want to get some uh, non-trivial uh, large N limit, uh, then uh, what you need to do basically is to first center your distribution and then scale it. That means that you will write M as AN plus BNY and then uh, you can have a hope to obtain something non-trivial if you take the large N limit of this quantity. And indeed this is what happens. And so at the end, uh, uh, the, the problem of this, I mean the, the, the statistics of extreme value uh, uh, for IID random variables boils down to uh, solving this, uh, uh, answering this question. That means finding these uh, numbers A, N, B, N, and the full distribution G of Z, such that this guy has a good limit, which eventually is given by G of Y. Okay, so it's better to talk about G of Y here. I, 
I think yesterday I was mostly using a G of Z, but if you don't mind, I prefer to use a G of Y today. Uh, uh, so what I told you yesterday, uh, without any proof, and again, I will not enter, uh, enter into proofs, but um, I told you yesterday that there are three un distinct universality classes, which are indexed by this number rho, which can take three values, one, two, or three, and this, these are uh, this Gamble, Fresh, and Weibull distribution. So yesterday I gave you this, uh, the form of this distribution. I, did, I didn't discuss too much um, what these ANs and BNs are. So that's basically what I want to do today, and go to these three classes and be a little bit more specific uh, and give you a sort of uh, full uh, account of uh, what, uh, what are really these uh, distinct, three distinct universality classes. Okay? So let's start with the first one. And let's look at the Gumbel, uh, Gumbel, Gumbel universality class. Okay. So again, uh, I told you that this corresponds to the case where typically uh, x star is infinite. And p of x, so this PDF here, has a decay, sorry, much faster than any power law. OK, so that means typically uh, an exponential decay. Uh, more generally, uh, one could think about something like that, right? Minus x to some power alpha, for instance, okay. when x goes to infinity. Yeah? Uh, yeah, OK, so what I. So when x star is infinite, this is really uh, the, the, the the these are the conditions. Now there is a subclass of cases where x star might be finite, and in that case, okay, probably I can just uh, uh, let, let me tell you. Otherwise, uh, it will be too much confusing. So uh, what is this case? So typically, suppose that you have a finite x star, and then p of x as is extremely singular, and it is basically of that form. It's not of a power law type, and it's basically of that form. Okay. So just to be clear, in the case where the finite, where there is a finite support, the typical universality class is instead Weibull, but Weibull corresponds to the case where it vanishes like a power law. So here it vanishes with this uh, highly uh, sing in this highly singular way. So in some sense, it's faster than any power law again in, in, in all the regimes. Okay. Fine. So, uh, yeah, sorry, this is the star minus x. <coughs> so in this case, uh, we said, I already told you that uh, g1, of, uh, g1 of y is just this uh, double exponential, which is this, this, uh, this gamble. Now, this quantity is a CDF, right? It's a cumulative distribution. And uh, if you want to know the PDF, the probability distribution is just, uh, let me call it small g1 of y, and that's just ddy of g1 of y, right? And if you take the derivative of this quantity, then you see that there is just a pre factor, which is just an exponential that comes here. And eventually, the form is the following. Right? So you see that essentially if you look at this, at this distribution, on the, right, on the right side, so if I would like to, to plot it, uh, if I would like to plot g1 of y, sorry, yeah, let me plot this function here. Uh, I'm not sure. Here you don't see anything already. No, OK. <coughs> OK, so I, I need to, to delete, erase this, but keep this in mind because it will come back uh, in a minute. Right, so <clears throat> what is this g1 of y? So I just, just want to, to insist on, the, on, on how it looks like and insist on one, one aspect, uh, so as a function of y. OK, so basically for large, if you look at the behavior for very large y, then basically this is very small compared to that. So 
At large positive y, this is essentially something which decays exponentially, so it's something relatively standard. Now, on the other hand, uh, if you look at what happens when y is negative, then you see that this quantity here becomes gigantic, okay? So that means that when y is negative, uh, this function actually vanishes extremely rapidly, okay? Much faster than any power law. So it has typically this shape. Uh, I never know whether the okay, maximum is around zero, actually. Maybe it's zero itself. So here you have a, okay, some exponential decay. But on the, on the left side, you see it's extremely, extremely, uh, vanishes extremely rapidly. Okay, it's a sketch. But, uh, now here I just want to, ins to insist, and this is basically, uh, you see this is something that, uh, so if I want to write it, uh, so you have this term here, but then in terms of, so you see it's something that decays extremely fast. Now, this is the, the distribution. Now, the question is, what about a n and uh, b n? So it turns out that in this case, uh, a n is exactly given by mu n. Okay, so that means that uh, you remember that we had this typical uh, estimate. We, we had this estimate of the typical value, I should say. Uh, and that means that a n itself is given by this by this. Uh, by this function here, right? So the mu n that we had before is precisely this a n. Yeah. Right. Yes. Right. So you see that to, to obtain a non-trivial uh, scaling limit, I need to, to look at the distribution close to, uh, close to mu n, right? So so in other words, uh, if I look at the distribution without, uh, so if I look really at the, the PDF of the maximum without doing any rescaling, okay? This quantity, so dm of the cumulative distribution, so that's the PDF of the maximum, then it will have, you see, I mean, it will have this, this uh, so it will be centered around a n, that's what I'm saying here, and it will have uh, some fluctuations around it, okay? So the fluctuations in this case will be gamble, so that means you will have something like that. You have something like this, okay? So that means that you have some probability to be, so I'm centering the distribution around this, but I have some probability that the minimum itself is actually much smaller than its typical value. So it's, it corresponds to some kind of quite atypical value where you are quite far from the typical, so from, from, from the average. Okay, so you have one sample, basically, where instead of the maximum, instead of, it should be around here, and it turns out to be uh, just there. And uh, there is this gap, so it's, it's just, so it's negative because you count it relatively to a n. Is that fine? Okay. <clears throat> so this is for a n. So again, this typical value that we had uh, now has a, a more precise meaning. This corresponds to the mode of your distribution. Okay. Now, what about Bn? So there is an explicit expression for Bn. Let me give it. It's a little bit, so it has, we, we could also have uh, somehow uh, guessed it, uh, but uh, at least it has, an, it has a nice uh, interpretation. So Bn is the ratio of two integrals. Uh, the first one is a kind of mean distance from An. And then you divide it by a n to plus infinity dx uh, p of x. Okay, so if I want to interpret it, uh, you see that b n is typically the distance between x i and a n, given that there is a single value between a n and plus infinity. Okay, so it's a kind of conditioned, uh, conditioned. Uh, mean value, okay? So that's the mean distance, average distance with respect to a n, given that there is basically a single particle, or single particle, single value uh, x i uh, in this interval, in this interval between a n and plus infinity. Okay, that, that, that's roughly the interpretation of that. So, okay, this formula is, uh, we have this, these two formula here. 
Now, let's uh, try to see a bit uh, more concretely what it means on a, co on a specific case uh, where you take p for p of x. So let, let's, let's try an example. And we will treat it uh, in two ways. Uh, a first one, which is very naive in the sense that uh, you could uh, look at this problem without knowing anything about all this theory. And then we will check that all these formula, which are given by the theory, actually matches with what you would naively uh, find without all this, uh, all this knowledge. So let's look at this very simple case where p of x is a simple exponential and positive. Okay? And it's zero otherwise. Okay? So let's write the distribution of the maximum in this case. Okay? So in this case, if I write here, is this is, is still okay? Sorry? Ah, uh, the list, yes, it should be here. Oh, thank you. Well done. Please. So if I want to look at the distribution of this guy, we have already computed it, right? We, we know that this is just the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity. So here, this is just cut to from zero. Because, okay. I wrote it. My formula was like this. So let's start with my formula. So that's the formula we had. Now p of x is zero on the negative side. So this interval actually only runs from zero to plus m. And if you just evaluate it, uh, what you will find is that this is just uh, basically 1 minus exponential minus m to the power n. Okay, For p of x equal to that. Okay. This is just the integral from 0 to plus m of this very simple guy. So now you want to take the limit uh, when n goes to infinity of that. So basically, the, the, the identity that you want to use, uh, and in fact, which is at the heart of all the asymptotic analysis uh, that you eventually do here, is the following. So there is, uh, if you take this uh, what you want to use is the following, is that <coughs> so we want to use this, 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 this simple identity, which is that if you look at the limit when n goes to infinity of 1 minus alpha over n to the power n, okay, well, you probably know that this is equal to exponential minus alpha. Okay? So, Given the form that I have here, you see, I mean, it's quite tempting to use this because I want to, to look at the large end limit of this. And uh, the claim is that uh, I want to use that formula. So, of course, it's not exactly of that form, but, okay, I can just rewrite it in the following way, which is that I will just write as 1 over n minus m minus log n to the power n. Agreed? I just divided by 1 over n and multiplied by 1 over n, but this multiplication by 1 over n, I just, by, by n, excuse me, I just wrote it exponential of minus minus log n. Okay, so it's a bit convoluted way to write something simple, but now, now I, I, I claim that I can just do easily the large n limit, because now, instead of looking at m, I will just make a shift here. So I will just look at log n plus y. So let's look at this quantity. Now, this quantity is what? It's just 1 minus 1 over n exponential minus y to the power n. Okay? Just identity. But now, I can use this, form this formula there. Okay? So in other words, now I'm ready to write that limit when n goes to plus infinity of f1n of log n plus y, you see, is just exponential of minus the exponential of that. And this is my function. This is my gamble, uh, gamble law. Okay. So this is just this g1 of y. Is that clear? So you see that now. So, of course, I didn't know anything about these formulas, but nevertheless, I've, I've, now I find a n. a n in this case is just log n. 
and bn, bn is just 1. Okay? Yeah. Yes? That's true. Sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So that's what I was somehow trying to say in words yesterday, which I can now demonstrate uh, more uh, precisely with formulas. Indeed, if you take this formula here and take the large n limit, as you say, I mean, they, it's a bit pointless. But what I need to do is to first center my variable and eventually rescale it. So instead of looking at m, I'm looking at, at a new variable, which I called before a n plus b n y. So here it's just m equal log n plus y, right? And now here you see, I mean, there is no more ambiguity. You agree that on that formula? I agree that here, taking the large n limit of this doesn't mean anything, or at least, although here, it's quite clear what you would obtain. So it's really what I meant yesterday is that if you don't do anything to this variable m, you won't obtain any uh, relevant results. Okay? So you really need to this, this shift to make this shift and eventually this rescaling. That means look at f1n of a n plus b n y. Here a n is log n, b n is 1, and you just eventually take the large n limit and that's what you get. Okay? So now we can check. So here you see, I mean, you, 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 you can do this computation without knowing anything about uh, this, this, this nice formalism. Okay. So now I just want to check that if you apply this formula, then you indeed find a n equal log n and b n equal 1. Okay. That's pretty simple in this case, so let's, let's try to do it. So it's a check now. It's a check of this formula. So how does it work? Well, in fact, the log n, you remember, we already computed it yesterday because we already computed mu n. Let's redo it again, but uh, so now we can check with the formula. So a n is such that, so let's first compute a n, which is such that the integral of a n to plus infinity dx exponential minus x is equal to 1 over n. And this is uh, just such that, so that, that, that tells you that exponential of minus a n is 1 over n, and just a n is just log n. So that's quite simple here. Okay? So that's in agreement with this observation that I made here, that we did there. Right? And now we can do the same for b n, okay? So I think we can do it also for b n because it's quite simple. Uh, is it simple? Yes, I think it is simple. So let's let's see how it works. So B n now has an explicit formula. Uh, B n is just the integral from log n to plus infinity dx of x minus log n exponential minus x, right? And this, of course, uh, this this integral here. Uh, okay, I could you could you could of course simplify. Uh, simplify this formula because we know that this is just 1 over n, okay? So this guy, okay, it's, I wrote it like this so that we understand really what we are doing, but in fact, there is now an, addition, an additional uh, simplification, right? Because this is just 1 over n in general, by, de by definition, right? So that means that uh, Bn is just uh, this divided by 1 over n, if you want, okay? So eventually, uh, you can just uh, evaluate this, uh, the, the, this integral, and um, and uh, what you find, uh, what you find is uh, is the following. So <clears throat> you get when you evaluate this uh, this integral, uh, what you get is the following. So let me write the explicit result. You uh, you get exponential of minus log n times one plus log n minus log n exponential minus log n, and, and there uh, we know what we get is just 1 over n, <coughs> right? So basically you see that the log n, exponential minus log n here just cancels, and you get 1 over n divided by 1 over n, which is just 1, okay? 
Okay, so that's also match that also matches perfectly our result here. Okay, so I just did this computation to show you that, uh, of course, the 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 two methods agree, uh, and also I wanted to show you. Uh, it's not a proof that you will always get the gamble here, uh, but at least on this simple case, you can see easily how this gamble form naturally emerges, okay? And it really emerges mathematically from this pretty simple, uh, pretty simple uh, uh, formula, okay? Fine, so now let's, so that's, that's the first class. Uh, maybe there is, uh, I would like to discuss another case briefly. Uh, yesterday, I didn't have this. I didn't have time to discuss too much the the, the Gaussian case, and I think uh, you should do that. You will do that in the um, during the class. But uh, I just want to 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 mention the nice application of the of, of what happens uh, in the Gaussian case. I will not do the computations. You will do them, but uh, there is a quite nice uh, quite nice effects to be mentioned. So I discussed the the, the, the the exponential. Now let me discuss the, the Gaussian case. Okay, so I will just take uh, random variables now, p of x, uh, which is uh, of that form. Okay, so it's one over two pi, so one over sigma, square root of two pi, exponential minus. Okay, and sigma is real positive. So. You can comp you have formulas here, and from this formula you can compute a n and b n. Okay, so a n is basically like mu n yesterday. So this is this is a computation that that you will do uh, later in during the class. Uh, in fact, the leading term is this guy, right? Which I which I showed uh, basically uh, yesterday. Now I just want to make a comment. Uh, of course, this is the leading term. You have seen that here basically a n is equal to log n is exact. In the case of the Gaussian, actually, this is not the exact result, but there are, this actually corresponds to an expansion for large n. So, so this is the leading term, but there are corrections to this leading term. And actually, it turns out that the corrections uh, are a bit more involved to compute. Uh, and they have the form, typically, that I show here, which is minus sigma over 2. And I will just comment on that. It's of the form log log n divided by square root of 2 log n. So, OK, and then. Uh, you have terms that, that are subleading compared, compared to that, right? So uh, then the, just want to mention that uh, you see that here first, the typical maximum grows quite slowly. Square root of log n is really a very, very slowly growing function. But what you also see is that the, the corrections are actually very, I mean, they decay with n, but they decay extremely slowly. What it means is that when you really analyze concrete data, uh, you have very strong finite size effects. And that actually, uh, when, the, when people started to, to, to develop all these theories, and then, then when they really began to apply to analyze concrete data, real data, uh, they were facing really these problems of finite size effects. Uh, and that means that they need really to be treated carefully, right? Of course, uh, I will not enter into these details, but it's good to know that. that uh, for IID of, uh, for extreme statistics of IID uh, random variables, there are extremely strong finite size effects. So that means that if you do simulations, and maybe you will have the opportunity to do some, uh, you will see that uh, finite size means finite n, okay? I, I have the, that means n here. So that's for a n. So instead of having uh, a, a logarithmic growth, you have a square root of log n, so it grows very slowly. Now, what is sort of more, uh, even more striking is the behavior of bn in this case. What you find is that bn actually behaves like that, so it's, it's, it's a computation, and probably you will not do it. Uh, if you want, you can do that, of course, but uh, I mean, this, this can be uh, an exercise also, but okay, it's, it's a little bit more involved. What you find is that bn actually decays when n goes to infinity. And in fact, it decays like 1 over square root of log n. And you see that it means that uh, it goes to 0 when n goes to infinity. So in other words, uh, if you look at the, uh, if you look at the, um, 
the distribution of the maximum, it will be something which is, uh, so if you look really at the, the distribution of P max, uh, so that's dm of F1 of m, it's almost a delta function, in fact, okay? So it, it's roughly speaking, it will be picked around sigma square root of log n, and it will have uh, a width which is extremely, extremely, uh, extremely small. So it's almost a delta function. And in fact, for large n, it will be, uh, roughly speaking, it will be uh, a delta function. Okay. So that's, that's not completely intuitive. I think that if you take just Gaussian numbers, and if you just look at the maximum, well, essentially, its value is almost deterministic. And it's actually sigma square root of log n with probability 1 when n goes to infinity. OK, it has a quite nice uh, application, uh, which I just want to mention. Although, uh, and it has to do, uh, it's a nice application regarding um, the a collection of uh, random workers, although I will talk later a bit more uh, about random walks. But let's look at the following problem, where I, I, I consider a collection of particles, of Brownian particles, OK? And so, so it's an application of that result which I find quite nice and quite simple. So you just consider n Brownian walkers, n Brownian motions, n Brownian particles, if you want to be more physical. And you suppose, I, I suppose that, so they, okay, let me just denote it by uh, xi, xi of t, and uh, such that they all start at zero, at the, at the same point, just to, to make the, the, the at, at initial time, they are all they are all sitting at the same position. Okay, so and I'm just doing that. So I'm looking at this. So they they are all uh, starting at the same position. Okay, and so they will do something like that. Right? They can cross, of course. We have so you have all these particles. Now, what I want to consider is the trajectory of the end of, of of the top the top path here. So. What I'm looking at is basically the, the envelope, if you want, of that. So here I will just look at this, these trajectories. OK? So I look, I'm looking at the leader. I mean, someone people look at, I mean, talk about the leader. I mean, this picture is quite clear. I'm looking at the guy uh, which is leading the trajectory of the leader. OK? So of course, there will be crossings, so that will not be always the same walker which is at the top. Now, what I claim is that in the large, if you have a large number of guys, from that result, what you can infer is that the trajectory of the leader is just completely deterministic. Okay, there is no more fluctuations. So, how can I see that? So, I just define. So, let's let, let, let's go let's go through the. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, that, that, exactly that. Yeah. So I define this guy x lead of t. So it's not a particle, if you want, but at at at, at any time t, this is the max. Okay. So indeed, uh, the label. I mean, the label of this of this leader. I mean, sometimes will be the worker number twelve. Sometimes it will be number worker number thirteen. Sometimes number one. Sometimes number ninety nine. But it's, OK, I don't like too much this color because I cannot see it very well. But it's this one, OK? So indeed, there will be some change at the lead. But I always focus on this guy, OK? So it, it's, it's quite a natural question in many, many, quest, in many problems, right? I mean, you have a large number of, of workers, uh, of particles, whatever, of pedestrians, whatever, uh, and you want to look at the trajectory of the leader. So I want to look at the max of this guy. Now, these are Brownian motions, OK? So all these Brownian motions, you see, uh, that means that if I look at a given time t, OK, so let's look at, at a given time t. OK, so I just take a picture at time t. OK, 
and I look at the, at, at the statistics of these guys. Now, so, of course, they are independent, okay? These, these Brownian particles are just independent. So if I want to say, at, if I look at time t, suppose that I want to look at the distribution of x lead, this is just the maximum of independent Brownian motions, okay? Now, these Brownian motions, all of them, actually, if I, if I look at the distribution of the PDF of xi's, these are Gaussians, okay? So then I, I will be able to apply this result, okay? So what I'm saying is that the PDF of xi of t is basically, uh, I mean, this is exactly what, what, what I was uh, writing here, so maybe I can just, uh, um, can just explicitly write it. So it, it's a Gaussian, okay? So it will be p of x and t, it depends on t now, uh, and it, it will have this form. So it will be sigma of t, square root of 2 pi, exponential of minus x square, divided by 2 uh, sigma, sigma square, sorry, sigma square. And now sigma square for Brownian motion, okay, so I forgot to, to, to give one uh, characteristic, is that all these Brownian particles, they have a, a diffusion coefficient d, the same one. I suppose that they have the same diffusion coefficient. And then the sigma square that I have here, uh, this sigma square is just 2 dt. Sigma square of t is just 2 dt, right? This is just uh, the mean square uh, displacement of the Brownian motion. Okay? So now you see, I mean, you can just apply this formula here, all this, what, what, is, what is written here, but replacing uh, sigma by square root of 2 dt, okay? And you see again, because of this sort of uh, concentration of measure uh, that I depicted here, what is happening is that the maximum is essentially a delta function, okay? So that means that when n is large, the maximum is, uh, so from that result here, what we know is that so for large n, so what we see is that the leader, x lead of t, which is the maximum here, so which identifies here with, with the maximum, so it will have a typical value, so it will be typically of this, this form, so which is sigma of t square root of 2 log n plus bn times uh, a gamble random variable, okay? Now this bn is just this sigma of t divided by square root of 2 log n. And then there is uh, some non-trivial uh, random variable here, uh, which I was, okay, which is basically y, which is distributed like a gamble. Okay, but in the large n limit, you see that this guy is going to zero, okay? So that means that for large n, the leading term is obviously this one. And this one is just a number, just a deterministic value. Now, sigma of t is what? We know it's just square root of 2 dt. So, okay, let's, let's go on. So we will, that, that will just give something which is square root of two, 4 dt log n. So again, uh, you see that uh, this is of the form, uh, I, have a, an, I have an effective uh, diffusion uh, coefficient here, uh, so that's square root of t times some uh, effective uh, uh, square root of the sorry. Effective diffusion coefficient, and this effective diffusion coefficient, you see that it's now proportional to log n. Okay, so you have actually, if you look at So essentially what is happening, if you really look at this problem, if you look at the leader in the very large n limit, well, basically it's just uh, something that goes like square root of t in the large n limit. Uh, it will just be uh, just square root of t. So it will be really deterministic. You will have very small fluctuations around it. And you can even predict 
the diffusion coefficient, which goes logarithmically with the number of particles. Okay, so that's quite nice application because it tells you that basically, uh, if you look at this assembly of Brownian particles, when n is large, if you look at really at the border of it, yeah, so sure, I should. Here, yeah, this is time. Here, yeah, this is the position. Then basically, the envelope here uh, is just is just deterministic. Okay. So that's uh, one application, and that that actually has nice um, nice uh, application in some uh, uh, search problems, predator prey. Uh, dynamics, these kind of things. There are a series of nice papers by uh, Sid Redner and uh, um, and co-workers, uh, Paul Krapivsky, on this kind of on this kind of things. Is that clear? Okay, so that's uh, that's for the Gumbel case. Gumbel case, sorry. So now let's move to the other cases. I will be a little bit more brief on the on, on the other cases, but. Um, I hope you could see how it works. Yeah. Well, here indeed, I mean, large n means, uh, well, you cannot really, okay, strictly speaking, uh, when n is very large, the, the, everything goes to infinity. So if you want to have a well defined large n limit, you need to rescale the things properly. Yeah. Well, it's clear, I mean, right? I mean, if, you, if n is very large, then you will occupy a very, uh, so. One, one, one thing that you can, maybe we can see this later. Uh, one way to give uh, a meaning to uh, when, you have, when, when you want to take a Brownian, sorry, uh, when you want to take some uh, thermodynamic limit starting from this kind of single particle uh, models uh, would be the following, with just a side remark, but one way to, 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 to have a non-trivial large end limit is to look at the following. So, <clears throat> and we will encounter this problem a bit later. So for instance, you can say the following. So there they all started from uh, the, same, the same point. And already when n is very large, this does not mean uh, anything. So what you do is instead is that you, you, you take your particle, say, between minus L plus 2 and plus L plus 2. And you put them randomly, uniformly. Okay? So you put n particles. And then you look at the limit when n is large, l is large at a row with fixed density. Okay. So if you want to take a large n thermodynamic limit starting from this kind of model, that's the, that, that's the procedure that you have to take. Okay. So that's, that would be the thermodynamic limit of this model if you want to have something non-trivial. We will see, actually, maybe not today, but probably tomorrow, uh, such an example. And then you can apply the result. There is one thing if you, you know, in one, one caveat, uh, if you do that, uh, <clears throat> which is the following, uh, which is that you still have, now if you take this, this, this model, so now, so the question that, that is asking, that, that now we are looking at is that these, these Brownian workers, uh, they are all, uh, there, will, there will still be Gaussians, okay? They, since that, since, they don't start from the same point, they won't be identical, okay? So that means that instead of being exponential of minus x square over two sigma square, this will be minus x minus xi zero, okay? So it's slightly different from what I, okay, slightly different from what I said before because this is a case where you have independent random variables but not identical. Still you can do things, uh, uh, and I will show an example how you can do something interesting uh, by such a method, uh, probably tomorrow or the day after. But that's true that in this model that I discussed, if you take blindly the large end limit, everything is blows up. But still, this is nice to, to, rem to remind that, and I think it's not completely intuitive, uh, that this, the, the top path is actually completely deterministic. Okay, so now let's move on to the second, uh, second class, uh, which is a Frechet, Frechet universality class, which corresponds to the case where, um, where you have a power law decay of the parent's distribution, okay? So here also you can actually work out uh, quite uh, simple examples, but so I'm not sure I want to, to cover a lot of examples actually there. And there is already one that we saw, so yeah, I will not. Uh, I will be quite brief here, but still. Okay, so this is the Frechet, and this corresponds to rho equal to. 
Okay, so yesterday I told you that this corresponds to the case where x star is infinite. And now this is the only case. I mean, for Frechet, you need really to have x star infinite. And then this, in this case, p of x for large x uh, has a power law, uh, which is of the form, uh, okay, just x to the power alpha minus alpha minus 1 when x goes to plus infinity. And alpha, of course, uh, is positive. OK? So in this case, um, there exists a n and b n. So again, uh, as before, there exists a n and b n. I will say what these a n and b n are, such that basically, if you look at this quantity here, a n plus b n y, if I take the limit n goes to infinity of this, then this goes to this function which I denoted by g2 of y. And g2 of y uh, was this, this guy, right? So it's uh, basically exponential of minus y minus alpha uh, when y is positive and is 0 otherwise. OK? So now I, I need to tell you what this a n and b n are. So in this case, a n is 0, fairly simple. And what is b n? Now b n is precisely mu n in this case. OK? So b n, so again, in that case, you again see that, that the mu n, the estimate that we had, give, the mu n that we estimated before gives you the, the order 0, if you want, of the, uh, the estimate of the maximum before the, the order 0 was a n, which is non-trivial. Now here, a n is 0, so the first non-trivial number to know is b n, and b n turns out to be exactly mu n. Okay? So that means that this mu n, I remember u1, this is, this is again this, this quantity. So one case that one can investigate is the Cauchy case uh, that uh, uh, we discussed yesterday, which was also mentioned this morning uh, uh, in the lecture, uh, in morning lecture. Uh, so if I take, so that's an example. OK, usually one take this one because actually uh, someone mentioned the, the Levy, Levy stable law this morning, of course. I mean, this one is, a, this is, is, is one of the Levy stable. Uh, and this is probably the most, one of the most interesting class of distribution which have a power law. Um, and this is, OK, this corresponds to basically in this, in this, in this case, this corresponds to alpha equal 1. Very good. So, well, I mean, we already did this computation last time, right? I mean, and we observed that this was basically given by this. Uh, uh, we have uh, already computed it, so I, I will not repeat the computation. Uh, what we found uh, is basically that, uh, okay, Bn is, uh, uh, is n over pi, okay? So that's the typical uh, scale of fluctuations in this case. They are proportional to n. So you see that uh, before we had only logarithmic behaviors. Now we have much stronger uh, fluctuations. Uh, I just want to comment on uh, one thing here. So in general, you see that, uh, and this is quite, quite interesting to see. So if you look at the, as before, if you look at the, at the PDF, OK, so you have G2 of here. So now let me just look at the, the PDF, which is the derivative with respect to y of this quantity. OK, so I want to look at the PDF of a Frechet. So this is just uh, what I call G2 of y, and which is d dy of g, g seconds of y. Then you see that it has, uh, I mean, it's very simple to take the, 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 if you differentiate it, you obtain alpha divided by y to the power 1 plus alpha, exponential minus, and y is positive. OK? So in 0, uh, there is no problem, right? I mean, the, this is diverging, but this is actually going to 0 much faster. OK? So that's something that goes, so if you plot this function, uh, you will see that it vanishes very rapidly close to zero. So it has this kind of shape. And then if you look at the large y limit, so when y is go, goes, 
I mean, y is very large, and basically this is one, okay? And what you recover is a power law, okay? And quite interestingly, this power law, so you have, so this is g2 of y as a function of y, and if you look at the leading behavior here, is alpha y1 plus alpha. And what's, what is quite, quite interesting is that this power law behavior is exactly the same as the parent distribution. Okay? And this is not a coincidence. Uh, the main reason for that is that when you look at the collection of, when you look at the maximum among a heavy tailed distribution, what is happening is that uh, basically the distribution is it, it's always dominated by, 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 by one single guy, and this single guy will have the same power law of this of this guy. Okay, so uh, that's quite quite nice to, to, to notice that is that this uh, this power here is just the same as the power in distribution. Yeah. 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 That's true. That's true. Yeah. 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 Okay. Now that's interesting. So the, what it means is that in the previous case, what we see is that typically there are actually two scales. One that scales, uh, one which really denotes the uh, the position of the maximum. And then there is another scale, which is Bn, which describes the fluctuations. Now here, what you see in this distribution here is that there is a single, only a single scale, basically, which controls both the typical position but also the typical fluctuations. So that's essentially the the the, the and they, that's true. I mean that that that's that's quite different. That's true. Yeah, that, that's, that, that's, of course, linked to that. That's true. Is that okay? So that's uh, an interesting remark, I think, to, 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 keep, to keep in mind. And I guess that that will be basically the same, I mean, the only thing that I want to say about, about this guy. In fact, in this case, there is no real simple case that you can work out easy, uh, I mean, Easily as I did before uh, for the exponential case, and I will just move to the to the third case, which is the the Weibull case. No, in this case, mu n is only describes the typical scale of the of your. So you see, I mean that. Uh, well, initially I was describing this mu n as something typical. I mean, so whatever it means. Uh, then you see that now that we are really that, that we are making progress and uh, analyzing in more detail the distributions, we are able to to, to give uh, some more um, precise meaning to this mu n. So we have seen before that this is basically the somehow the mean value of the fluctuations in the first case, which is this a n, the mode or mean value, roughly speaking. And now what we are saying here is that in this second case, mu n is actually something else. Uh, this mu n is the typical scale of the fluctuations. Okay? So well, it's not the typical scale of the fluctuation. In this case, this is the scale of fluctuations. Yes? Uh, in the comment about the parent distribution and about some simple value, yeah. some Yes, actually, I mean, this comment was not uh, extremely. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay, well, what I wanted to say. Uh, you, can, you, you see here, uh, basically, that uh, the maximum has the same, dis so, so, has the same tail as the, as the parent distribution, and this is quite generic for all kinds of power laws. What I wanted to say, uh, but I didn't explain it very well, is the following. Indeed, uh, if you look at the, in this case, so if, if you think about, I, I just wanted to compare the scales that we are computing here with the scales that we obtain when you sum these random variables, okay? So you see, I mean, uh, let's look at the, the, the exponential case, for instance, before. So in the exponential case, we know that uh, if I sum these exponential random variables, they have a finite mu, right, because they are only positive, 
So the sum typically will be proportional to n. Okay. And more generally, okay, now suppose that you would have, uh, I could relax something, which uh, suppose that now instead of having this, uh, uh, this uh, purely, uh, look at the Gaussian, maybe the Gaussian is better. Let, let's look at the Gaussian. So you sum your, your, your Gaussian random variables, they are of mean zero, but the typical sum will be of order square root of n, okay? Now, the maximum actually that you obtain in this case is of order square root of log n, okay? So that means that for Gaussian random variables, the scale of the sum and the scale of the maximum has just nothing to do. That means that the sum is really built from a large number of, of random variables, okay? Because if you just take the maximum, you could say, okay, if I take a large number of random variables, basically I am dominated by a, a few ones. Obviously, this is not true for Gaussians, right? Because if you add a few random variables which are of order square root of log n, there will be of order square root of log n, and there will be never of order square root of n. There is a very large gap. Now, in this case, if you take this, uh, this, uh, this Frechet uh, distribution, if you look at the sum, the sum actually will be of order n. And n here is basically of the same order as the maximum, okay? Because we see that the maximum is of order n. The sum is, will be of order, also of order n. And the same holds for uh, alpha here, for, for, this, for generic alpha smaller than two, okay? If alpha is smaller than two, the sum will be of order n to the power one over alpha, and the maximum will be also of the same order. So that clearly means that in these cases, the sum is actually dominated by one or two guys. Uh, because they are just of the same order. And the situation is quite different from, from the simple Gaussian case. Is that clear? I was a bit fast uh, before, uh, but, but that's what I meant. Okay, so that's a sort of demonstration of, what, of the common folklore that we hear sometimes, uh, that uh, you, when you take a large number of fat tails, random variables, if you take the sum, then typically this would be dominated by a few ones. Here you can really show that explicitly. Okay, so let's move to the third case, this Weibull, Weibull case. <clears throat> yeah. So that's rho equal to three. So now in this case, we have uh, x star, which is finite, okay? So that's what I was uh, depicting yesterday. So if I look at p of x, so I don't care too much what happens uh, far from x star, but there is a finite x star, okay? So here it's very important that x star is finite, right? So that's really, uh, and, rho and, and the density here, close to it vanishes as a power law, okay? So it's not this essential singularity that I was describing before as exponential of one uh, over blah, blah, blah. Uh, now here, uh, I have something which is x star minus x uh, to say the power alpha minus one, okay? So this is one case that, so for instance, alpha equal one is just the uniform distribution, okay? So in this case, uh, I, I told you that uh, there exists uh, a n and b n, so, I mean, okay, uh, such that, well, again, if I take the, the cumulative distribution of the maximum, and if I center it this way, uh, then this limit when n goes to infinity uh, is well-defined, and it's given by some function, g3 of y, and G3 of Y has this, this curious shape, okay? So we will see, I mean, it might, might, might uh, appear or sound strange. Uh, we will see on one example that it's actually not strange at all. Okay. So it's one when Y is positive and it's exponential minus mod Y to the power alpha for Y negative. So this, this is called the viable, viable distribution. So alpha equal one is a simple uh, basically uh, half, uh, half exponential. Now, so this I told you already yesterday. Now, what about a n and b n? Well, obviously here a n, as you could guess, is basically x star itself, okay? So you need to look at the maximum close to x star to see something non-trivial. 
So here you get, again, a n equal to x star, and b n, again, is equal to mu n. Okay? So, so again, I should maybe, uh, uh, is it equal to, uh, to mu n? Uh, how did I do? Yeah, maybe, okay, uh, bn is such that, uh, okay, it's, it's essentially the same, but I just want to, re to, to, to recall it here. Uh, it's not exactly it's 1 minus mu n. So it's, it's defined in the same way, but okay. Uh, bn is, is defined like this, so is x star and x star minus bn. So it's basically related to, to mu n, but not, not quite, not exactly the same, okay? So uh, mu n is equal to x star minus bn, okay? So that's, but again, you obtain bn exactly as we did before. So bn is such that there is uh, typically one values in the interval x star minus bn x star. Okay, so it's related to, to, uh, to, to mu n. It's basically x star minus, uh, let's, let's write it explicitly. In fact, uh, in this case, we get that uh, mu n is x star minus bn. So let's let's look at one concrete one one concrete and simple example because uh, we have uh, probably I already mentioned it I think uh, uh, briefly last time uh, precisely to evaluate mu n in that case you remember that we looked at the distribution uh, which is uniform on zero one and we had found that mu n is one minus one over n if you look at your notes so let's see. Let's do as we did for the exponential. Let's do it blindly. I mean, let's try to do the computation uh, as, uh, I mean, uh, in a very simple way. So <clears throat> I will just take this, this, uh, this uh, p of x, which is basically 1 uh, if x is in between 0 and 1 and is 0 otherwise. OK? And I want to compute again the same quantity, right? F1 of n, which is the probability that x max is less than m. And obviously here, this is what? Uh, this is, uh, OK, so two cases. First, maybe suppose that m is larger than 1. If m is larger than 1, then this probability is 1, OK, because all the values are bounded by 1. So the probability that the maximum is less than 100, obviously, is 1. And then if m, so this, this, this one here is basically this one there, OK? So the, that's, the, that's the idea. And now what about the value here? Well, here this is just the integral from, say, 0 to m dx to the power n, OK? Because p is just 1 in this case, OK? So. OK, let's, let's just look at the case now, uh, m uh, smaller than 1. And then you see immediately that I will do the same trick as I did before. So if I integrate this, of course, I get m to the power n. OK, so m to the power n is not very nice. OK, because again, I want to use this very simple formula that 1 minus alpha over n to the power n goes to exponential minus alpha. So just I will just do. Uh, kind of, uh, we just write it this way, right? And I'm sure you will agree with that. It's not the simplest way to write m as one minus one minus m, but still it's correct. And then this gives you simply the idea to look at not f one n of m, but say look at f one of m. Sorry, one minus x or y, sorry, over n, because uh, this is, would just be 1 minus, so 1 minus m, but this is just 1 over n. So now you are happy. 
okay? Because when n goes to infinity, this quantity has a nice, has a nice expression. And this just goes to exponential minus y. So this, of course, holds. Uh, I need to have y negative, OK? y positive, sorry. So maybe I should change a little bit. Ah, yeah, maybe, maybe I, gave, I gave you a, a, wrong, uh, a wrong sign here. I'm sorry. Um, let's check. Ah, no, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Okay, so another way, uh, maybe I should, uh, so instead of doing that, sorry, so let, 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 me, let me do it this way so, so that I, I can just, uh, because it's, otherwise it will be a bit weird. So let's do it this way. So if I write the things like that, of course, y has to be negative, okay, because otherwise it's y. So this is just this if y is negative, and obviously this is just 1 if y is positive. OK, so what I'm claiming is that now on this formula, I have everything that I said there. OK, so this is G3 of y for alpha equal 1, OK, because I have this is 1 indeed if y is positive. So this is this guy. And this is just exponential of minus mod y, which is indeed the case. Exponential of plus y is just exponential of minus mod y because y is negative. So that's my function g3 of y. Now, I also immediately check that x star here is 1. So I just check the, the fact that a n is equal to x star. OK? And you can immediately check also that b n has to be equal to 1 over n because if you just put p of x is equal to 1, you integrate X, this integral from x star minus bn to x star, this is just bn, and you immediately obtain bn equal 1 over n. There is no computation. Is that OK? So this is another case, you see, where you can apply this nice, I mean, you can apply this. Again, you see the same trick appears, and you can just check uh, the formula. OK, so that more or less. Uh, uh, yeah. OK, there is something that I would like maybe to cover to finish, um, which is the generalization to the case maximum, because it's pretty nice and it's not, OK, you, you will not see very often this computation. Uh, I've not invented it. I mean, it's quite standard, but uh, it's not something which is taught so, 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 so frequently. So I would like to take the opportunity just to, to, to show you how it works. So, yeah. Right. Uh, you mean, yeah, so it's, OK, so, yeah. So uh, if, if, if you go to, uh, so if, if it goes to, to some constant, for instance, you mean? Yeah, if you go to some constant, uh, that's basically alpha equal 1. That's just the, like the step. OK, so suppose that you arrive at some, at some finite value, then this will be, the, this corresponds to alpha equal 1. Okay, so finite value. I mean, it can diverge. Yeah, it can diverge. So it can diverge as, as, as OK. Then in, that, in this case, so alpha needs to be strictly positive, because otherwise it's not normalizable. And in that case, you are, you, 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 this is also covered by this case. But indeed, alpha needs, uh, maybe I should, uh, alpha needs to be strictly positive. OK? So let's comment on the on the on this uh, last part that I want to, to to tell you because it's I will basically show you one formula and then just give you the uh, because um, so this was for the first maximum okay now just I, I would like to I want I would like to generalize this to uh, to the case maximum. So again, uh, what, I, what, what I had in mind uh, is that I, I, I'm looking at now at these values. 
So I have M1N, which is X max. And then I have M2N, which is the second. So this is the first maximum, the second maximum, and etc. So note that, and then there will be a last guy, which is X min. So note that I, here I I'm, I'm work with uh, continuous variables. I mean, they have densities. And that means that uh, there are basically no tights, right? I mean, no two, never of these two guys will be equal. Say it differently, uh, the probability that uh, they are equal is zero, OK? Which is not true if you take discrete random variables and you have all kinds of combinatorial uh, com complexification that, that arises. But here, it's pretty simple. So let me just write this way, these guys on the line, and then do the, the combinatorics. Uh, that, that, that I want. So I have, say, here M1N. Uh, I would have here M2N, and etc. And so here, uh, I would like to have my uh, MKN. And then here, I would like, I will have MK plus 1, etc. And here, we'll have the last guy, MNN. -N. OK? So I would like, so before, everything that I was talking about was about this guy. Now I would like to say something about some generic maximum. Okay, say this guy, mk. So how, one way to think about it is simply that I will count the number of points which are uh, below and above this guy. So I have, that means that, so I, I want to focus on this, on this point here. So that's really the guy that I am after. So there are k minus 1 value here. And uh, behind here. Uh, I just have n uh, minus k, uh, n minus k plus 1, OK? Is that OK? Yeah. So except that I should take this guy. Now, so I have n points. Now what I want to compute is, the, is this probability, OK? So I, let me introduce this uh, more complicated object, if you want. I want to have that fkn, which is fkn of m, which will be the probability that mkn is smaller than m. OK? So mkn, so suppose that uh, you have, uh, so it, it needs, so it, it has to, to it, it has to be uh, smaller than m. So there are several possibilities such that uh, this is true. The first possibility is that all of them are below the value m. OK? But there is another possibility, which would be that there is the first maximum, which is above m, and uh, all of them are just all the, resting, all the rest of the points, basically, the k minus 1, k minus 2 in that case, will be below m. Or I could have the possibility that these two guys are above m, but the rest up to mkn are, are smaller than m, and etc. So that translates uh, into, the, in, into the following, uh, the following uh, sum of, of probabilities. So the first term is the probability that, again, all the points are below, uh, below n, right? So let me just write it this, this, this way. So that's just the probability for minus infinity to m dx p of x to the power n. But now, again, there could be an additional probabilities, which are the case where basically m is there. So in, in this case, that corresponds, OK, maybe it's not. This corresponds to the case where m is roughly here, and they are all seed below m. Now, another configuration that will com contribute is the following, where only one is below m, but all these guys here sit below m. So that's the following probability. I will have, so I have this probability dx p of x to the power n minus 1. And then I have one guy which is above. That means m to plus infinity dx p of x to the power 1. And then you see these random variables are just identically distributed and independent. So I have actually n ways of choosing this first guy. Okay, this first guy might be any one of these of these guys. So I have a factorial n here. Okay. 
So now I can just go a little bit below that. So the next time, the, the next types of configurations are such that only two guys are above M, and the rest is below. And so I will do the same here, basically. So that corresponds to such a case where I have a sum for minus infinity to M, D of X, P of X, sorry, N minus 2 this time, and two of them sit below. That means M plus infinity, DX, P of X, but now to a square. And now you see that I had to choose two Xi's among N, and of course, uh, the pair is indistinguishable, so the number of such pairs is just n, n minus 1 over 2. Okay? And then you see how it works. Okay, so generically, uh, eventually the formula that you can write, let me write it. Uh, so you will do that, and okay, the last term that, 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 you, can, that you can do, when you arrive here, so that's the last, the last term that you get. So that means that you have k minus 1, which are above, above m, but mk has to be below. Okay. And that's the last set of configuration. So let's write it explicitly. So that would be minus infinity to m, d of x, p of x, to the power, uh, to the power here. So I have k minus 1 k minus 1 points, and then there is a set, uh, maybe you won't see it, to the power, sorry, so here this is n minus k minus 1, so this is n minus k plus 1, here you get k minus 1, and then you see again here I have to choose k minus 1 points among n, so this is just n choose k minus 1. Okay, that's fairly simple, a bit tedious to write, but, but fairly simple. Okay, so you can write it uh, in, a more compact, in a more compact way. And which is, okay, I will not do the, the asymptotic analysis because it's pretty, pretty hard, but I mean pretty hard. It's not pretty, very hard, but... Uh, So I can just write it as a sum over j from 0 to k minus 1. Okay, so that's basically counts the different terms here. So that will be j equal 0, j equal 1, etc., up to j equal k minus 1. So that means that I am counting the number of variables which are sitting above m. Either there are 0 or there might be 1, there might be 2, up to, a, up to k minus 1. So this is that. There is a combinatorial factor here, n j, n choose j, sorry, and then I have this product here that you have. Okay, so let's write it. That's a quite useful formula. Might be useful some sometimes. Okay. N minus j, and then the other guys are above. So if I have n minus j, then I have j. Okay. So that counts the number of guys which are above m, and that got, that counts the number of, of 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 guys which are below m. Okay. So again, uh, now the question is, how do you do the large n analysis of this? Okay. Of course, it's slightly more complicated than we had before, but still it's doable. And in fact, the result is is, is fairly simple. It's, it is very nice, in fact. Uh, and uh, the result is that so again. We will have three different universality classes, which are the same as before, or equal one, two, or three, Gumbel, Frechet, or um, Weibull. And so now you need to rescale properly this guy. And you will rescale it, in fact, in the same way, with the same ANs and same BNs. So that means that you will have AN plus BNY. And this actually goes to uh, a nice function. And this. Let me write it explicitly. This is just g rho of y, which I gave you before. And there is a sum here, sum from j equals 0 
to k minus 1 minus log of g rho of y. It's a bit more complicated formula, but j divided by factorial j. OK? OK, for those of you who like special functions, this can be viewed as an incomplete gamma function of log of minus log of g rho. Okay, but I, I, will not, I will not comment too much on that. But that's actually quite nice because uh, uh, one can really uh, have an, an explicit expression for, um, for the case maximum. And it has a limiting form, which is fairly explicit, right? So here, depending on rho, again, rho might be 1, 2, or 3, OK? So either Gamble, Frechet, or Weibull, you have these very, very explicit formulas. Um, I guess uh, I can uh, even end up with a, a more general result, and then uh, this will close what I would like to do to say about this IID. Um, so here you see, I mean, this is something about the, the case gap. The, sorry, the case maximum, or I just looked at the one maximum, or say the, the, the second, the, the case one. But in fact, you have a stronger result uh, that gives you the joint, joint law of the k first. Okay, so if you ask, what is the joint law of the k first maxima? And this is known. Uh, it has also a quite nice and simple expression. I will just give you. And that, that will be. So I, of course, it's the strongest result that I gave because it contains all the results that I that I've said, told you before. It's a bit of work to show it. Uh, but it's nice to know that it exists because one, once you know it, essentially, you can do many things about, I mean, essentially, anything about the statistics of this extreme. Okay, so. Uh, that's a more complete, uh, it's a more general result, if you want, uh, about the joint law and the joint law of, uh, what, joint law of what, uh, of M1N, M2N, to mkn. So again, here I am in a limit where k is fixed and n goes to infinity. Okay. So you can, so this is a vector. It's a kind of multivariate statistics, if you want, so k-dimensional statistics. And this is actually, uh, uh, so what you, what, what, what you know is that, so first you need to center and rescale all these guys. So I center them. So I look at m1n uh, close to a n, and I normalize it, and I do the same. Uh, for all of these guys, okay. So I just take these guys, normalize them, and when n goes to infinity, this goes to some limiting form vectors w1, w2, wk, and in fact, uh, the joint law of these of these guys is known. And what is it? Well, it's, it looks like IID random variable. So it's a product measure. So it's G rho of uh, WK. It's not quite. And product from I equal to 1 to K of J prime WI divided by G rho WI. Okay, so that's a bit. A complicated formula, not that much. You see, I mean, it has so g rho, of, g rho prime is just the, the derivative of g rho, j rho, and rho is again uh, one, two, three. So you see, I mean, they, they have this product product measure here. So that yeah, I, I saw you. Uh, they they look independent, but they are actually not quite independent because they need to be ordered. Okay, so. They live in a okay, so that creates some correlations between this case maximum, of course, because they need to be ordered. Okay. This measure is non-zero only if W1, W2, WK is is, is ordered.
exactly. Yeah, 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 exactly. So that's what I was, that's what I meant by say. That, so I, I look at k finite, and I take n goes to infinity. Yeah. So another limit that you could uh, study, and I think okay, I think that case at least I don't know any uh, result, explicit result, uh, which is for instance if you want to look at uh, uh, so you look at k over the n. I don't know. You want to look at the middle of the spectrum, for instance. I mean the middle of of the guys, right? So that that would be another limit. Do to what? Yeah. Okay. So yeah. Uh, in principle, uh, from that formula, this should be. I mean, uh, this formula contains anything that you that, that you want, and you can do some uh, different type of uh, scaling uh, analysis. I did here the sort of uh, what I did here actually is just to look at the typical fluctuation somehow in the regime where k is fixed and n is large. But you can imagine a lot of different, uh, I, I agree, uh, a lot of different uh, scaling regimes. What I expect is that prob most likely, if you look at slightly different regimes, uh, you will lose certainly universality. But this does not mean that, that this is not uninteresting. But uh, most likely, these other regimes will be non-universal. Here, of course, there is something which is quite amazing, is that uh, this does not depend on anything. I mean. Uh, but you're right. I mean, so that's why I wanted to give you the formula if you want to play with other. In principle, this one is exact, and you can do all kinds of uh, different scaling. Yeah, that's that's a good point. Well, because uh, okay, <laughs> uh, this is uh, my intuition. Uh, I guess that uh, okay, you will sort of probe some kind of large deviation regimes. And this means that usually when you start to look at some large deviation regimes, you lose the universality. I mean, you begin to be more sensitive to the details of, uh, of, 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 the, of the initial uh, parent that distribution, P of x. But that's not uh, proof. <laughs> Other questions? OK. So right. So that's basically. Uh, Everything that so that, that's what I wanted to tell you about uh, the uh, the IID. Uh, I mean the extreme statistics of, of IID. Um, we covered quite quite a I mean large subject at the end. Um, so and properties. And uh, what I would like to do now, uh, I think I still have uh, like 15 minutes. Huh? So um, so what I so uh, in the introduction yesterday uh, I. Sort of try to show you, to show you, or convince you that uh, okay, this IID case uh, is very nice. I hope you uh, could appreciate it. But nevertheless, most of the situations that you would encounter in, in statistical physics uh, have to deal with correlations or correlated random variables. And uh, so, basically, uh, one one uh, one example that. Uh, 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 that uh, I will cover in, in the following uh, is the case of uh, random walks. Uh, and uh, the reason why uh, I want to cover random walks is the fact that this is a quite strongly correlated system. Uh, but before, maybe before doing this, this, this full analysis, uh, I just still want to convince you that this IID case, that's true that I had this hypothesis, of course, that Really, I needed them to do all these computations. I really needed them to be uh, IID. And that means really we, without any correlations between them. Now I want to show you some arguments, some physical arguments, as to, to, to convince you that, in fact, these results are pretty robust. And uh, still, if you have some weak correlations in your system, you can sort of, I want to convince you that these results uh, can still hold. Okay? So before going to the harder case of strongly correlated systems, uh, let's look at the case of weakly co weak, weak correlations. Okay? And probably uh, I, will, I will end up with that. <clears throat> so again, uh, the, 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 the thing is uh, uh, all these results, uh, all these nice results holds for uh, IID.
uh, random variables. And the questions, uh, that the question that, that you want to, that I want to raise here and partially answer uh, is uh, what, what are the effects, or what, are, what, what should I expect? What are the effects uh, of, what are the effects of uh, correlations? So let's look at the, the case of weak correlations, and let me present you uh, some uh, physicist argument, which is essentially a kind of uh, decimation argument, decimation or renormalization argument, which goes as follows. So let's consider the case, so to fix what I, what do I mean by weak correlations? So I will consider the case where you have this, uh, so I have in mind, for instance, that uh, this X size, uh, so this index I represents some uh, index in space. So that means that uh, I have some value at, at site I, that might be a height, for instance. Okay. So here I would have X1. Uh, here I would have x2, and here I would have x3. Uh, it can be they can be negative. I would have x4, and etc. Okay, so in general, you would you would have uh, some xi here. So what do I mean by weak correlation? So I have now in mind that i represents some uh, site index. So by weak correlations, uh, I mean Suppose that the correlations actually are decaying exponentially. Okay, so in other words, okay, so if I compute these two point correlations, connected correlations. Okay, I will assume that they actually decay as exponential minus i minus j. OK? So what does it mean? Well, it means that essentially beyond the scale of order xi, beyond, beyond the length scale of order xi, you lose completely the correlations between your variables. So I will do some decimation or some uh, renormalization in, 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 the, in the real space. And I will just do the following. So I will, I will have my variables here. So these are the, the i's. And so what I will do is basically to uh, cut the system in blocks of size xi. So I'm doing some real space uh, blocking or renormalization, if you want. So I have a size, so I have these blocks of size xi. And here, of course, I have x1, etc. x1, x2. Well, you understood, OK? So what is the meaning of that? Well, roughly speaking, it means that this block is basically independent of that one, which is also independent of that one, etc. OK. So here, I will have also xi. OK. So these blocks are independent, right? So I can just sort of guess. So these blocks are independent. And uh, essentially what it means is that, uh, and, and what, so these blocks uh, are just independent. <laughs> yes, yeah, sure. So for the site of the boundary, so you will have some surface effects, which will contribute some correlations, okay? But of course these correlations are proportional to the surface, while you mean, I mean, the, the, the rest of the, uh, of course, there, there will be some intermediate, uh, if you want, correlations here. But in the bulk, basically, these correlations will be basically decorrelated. So let me just tell you how, what I mean by that. Well, first, I mean, the, the first thing is that the, the correlations between these guys is just, so here, if I have, imagine that you have a system, a system in, in D dimensions. 
So typically these correlations will be proportional to L to the power D minus one. Okay, because these are surface effects. Okay, so there will be some bleeding in that in that sense compared to the bulk. Okay. Yeah. Tell me. Well, on the surface of, of, of the oxide, okay. But that will be something, uh, let me see. Uh, so basically, within each block, I will introduce, uh, I will do the maximum within each block, okay. So I will just, I have the block M1, but at the moment I don't do any, any. I just define the maximum within this block, so that uh, max, max one, uh, this is basically max two, and etc. Okay, so I just, in each block, if you want, I just take the largest value. Okay. But that's the standard, I mean, basically, Pyre's argument, right? when, when you do the, the, and the analysis of phase transitions. Okay? You just do this, uh, neglect this, these boundaries. Now here, uh, again, I will take the maximum among these guys. Okay. So again, this is a heuristic argument. This is not a proof. Then I will I will give you some more uh, precise results. Uh, so what I'm saying is that so again, you divide your system you divide your system in uh, in a certain uh, number of blocks and of xi blocks. Okay, which is still uh, much bigger than one. It's much bigger than one because xi, of course, I mean, I'm saying that it has short range correlations, so xi is much smaller than the size of the system. So xi is much smaller than, uh, than n. And now the idea is basically to, I mean, the x max that I am after, I can just, again, write it as uh, the max of this maximum within the blocks. Okay, max of p. Uh, for p ranging from one to n over xi. Okay. Now the argument uh, goes as follows: is that essentially, uh, and when n is large, what is happening is that basically the you can neglect the correlations between these local maxima. Okay. So in other words, uh, and that's the definition of xi. It just tells you that uh, this max there are just uh, IID random variables. Okay. And so in this case, you see by this blocking procedure, uh, assuming again that you can somehow uh, neglect, neglect the correlations uh, at the boundaries that, that you were mentioning, if you assume that, uh, then indeed you are back basically to this IID random variable. Okay. So that suggests that, suggests that uh, this IID uh, class uh, is actually uh, is actually uh, uh, quite quite robust. And in fact, uh, there are several cases that that you can uh, and you can work work out. In fact, this case essentially is, is a case that you can work 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 it out explicitly. I mean, basically this corresponds to to a case of einstein nuremberg process, which you can solve exactly when you have exponential uh, decay of correlations. And you can indeed show that in the large n limit, uh, you will recover uh, the, the, the result of IID random variables. So that's, that, that suggests okay, that it's not a proof again, uh, but you are back to the uh, extreme statistics for IID. And there is, in fact, a much stronger theorem uh, which is due to Bergman, which concerns the fact where, suppose that the x size are, uh, just to show you, I mean, how strong it is, uh, suppose that uh, the x size are uh, a Gaussian stationary process, they constitute uh, that the x size A Gaussian stationary process. That means that if you look at the uh, distribution of the Xi's, they are just Gaussians. 
And on top of that, all the correlations uh, are given by uh, a Gaussian measure, and it's stationary. That means that uh, if you look at uh, these correlations here, then this is only a function of i minus j. Okay, so that's, uh, that's what it means, stationary. Okay, so the correlations only depend on the distance. Now, I was considering the case where this decays as exponential, and I tried to argue uh, by hand-waving arguments, I agree, that uh, you end up with this IID random variables. Now, the theorem actually tells you that if the correlations, uh, if C of uh, n decays uh, basically much faster uh, than 1 over, well, basically, uh, if, uh, let's do it this way, if log n, cn goes to 0 when n goes to infinity, okay, so that means that if log n, if cn decays slightly faster than 1 over log n, then you are back to this uh, IID case, okay. And the main reason is basically uh, uh, you are back to the, uh, or basically x max. Uh, behave as behave as the maximum of IID one variable. So that's actually uh, this argument. Indeed, uh, is actually extremely uh, extremely robust. I mean, not only the argument but also the results, uh, and that means that uh, so. That means that all the results that we have derived there, I mean, okay, they are not completely uh, useless. I mean, they will hold in a very wide uh, class of situations. Yeah, is it readable? Yeah, and what I'm saying here is that, yeah, it's not very well written, so. If C of n times log n goes to zero, so that means that basically if C of n decays faster than, than one over log n, so one over log n is something that, that decreases very, that decays very, very slowly. Um, then, uh, then you are you are you are not okay. So that's uh, quite nice, uh, but nevertheless, uh, in some cases, this is not enough. And uh, in what we uh, what we we'll see uh, uh, tomorrow uh, is that uh, in some interesting cases, namely the case of random walks, obviously we are not uh, in this situation. I already mentioned it. I mean, the correlation there is growing are growing, and so obviously this kind of argument cannot, cannot hold, and we will see that we have to, de to, to, to design a new, new, new theory, new, new methods, and you will see that for random walks, uh, it turns out that the, the, the questions of extreme value statistics are quite intimately related to first passage properties uh, of random walk, and that's something that uh, I will discuss um, next time. Okay, thank you for your attention. Or oh, maybe your question, sorry. Yeah, sure. Yeah, this one, this one, okay. So uh, I, I just, I, I, I defined very, I mean, okay, briefly what a Gaussian stationary, this is not defined, but do you know what a Gaussian stationary process is? Okay, uh, so uh, this is the correlation matrix, C of I minus J. So now the idea is that, uh, so basically, with this argument that I had here, I mean, I was considering the case of exponential decay because I had in mind, for instance, the high temperature phase of rising model or whatever, where you have an exponential decay. Now, it turns out that if the correlation C of n decays faster than one over log n, okay, so that's what it means, right? If log n times C n goes to zero, that means that's log n times C n, yes, okay. Is it okay? So that means that C o, if C of n decays like 1 over log n, basically, or slightly uh, faster than 1 over log n, then basically the, 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 the statistics of x max in the large n limit, of course, will be given by the IID. Okay. And this is, of course, for n goes to infinity. Okay. So this case, of course, I mean, this is quite, 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 quite hard to, to, to show. But there are actually some cases, I mean, for instance, if you want to convince you that this case holds, I mean, 
uh, I could give you some references uh, where you can do it for the Einstein Nuremberg process, for instance, which has this exponential uh, decay, and where you can work out uh, explicitly the distribution and show that indeed it converges to this to this Gamble law. Okay, now the question. Okay.